I decided to go to Rome and, and do the movie with Bruce, and of course he killed me. Chuck Norris and Bruce Lee were close friends and were both incredible and legendary martial artists. While Chuck has become a living meme, Bruce met a tragic end far too soon. Even now, the reason for his death remains uncertain. However, a recent revelation from Chuck Norris has stirred up new discussions. Many theories suggest Lee's death was due to cerebral edema, while others point to sodium deficiency. After 50 long years of his demise, we haven't been able to reach an emotional closure, but it seems that his close friend had all the answers as Chuck Norris finally revealed the shocking truth about Bruce Lee's death. Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris stand out as two of the most iconic figures in martial arts and action cinema. But what brought these legends together, and how did their friendship evolve into one of the most memorable showdowns in film history? Let's rewind to the late 1960s, a time when both Lee and Norris were rising stars in their respective domains. By this time, Lee had already gained recognition in Hong Kong with his groundbreaking films like The Big Boss and Fist of Fury, establishing himself as a martial arts phenomenon. On the other side of the globe, Norris was making waves as a karate world champion, clinching numerous titles and championships both in the U.S. and internationally. Their paths converged at the All-American Karate Open Championship in 1967, a pivotal event where Norris emerged victorious while Lee captivated the audience with his electrifying martial arts demonstration. Following the competition, the two martial arts maestros connected and delved into discussions about their shared passion for combat and martial arts philosophy. Recognizing their mutual respect and affinity, Lee and Norris decided to take their camaraderie a step further by training together in Lee's backyard. Lee, always receptive to new ideas and techniques, found himself benefiting from Norris's insights, particularly in the realm of high kicking. Initially, Lee adhered to the belief that kicks should not ascend above the waistline, a principle he had embraced in his martial arts philosophy. However, Norris introduced him to the concept of kicking anywhere, emphasizing the strategic advantage of targeting vulnerable areas, such as the head, if the opportunity presented itself. Recognizing the validity of Norris's perspective, Lee embraced the challenge of incorporating high kicks into his repertoire. Within a mere six months of dedicated training, Lee's proficiency in high kicking matched that of Norris, an accomplishment that spoke volumes about Lee's adaptability and commitment to mastering new skills. In turn, Norris found himself equally impressed by Lee's attributes, his speed, power, and unique approach to combat philosophy. Immersed in Lee's innovative style of Jeet Kune Do, Norris gained invaluable insights into a martial arts philosophy that transcended the confines of traditional practices. Jeet Kune Do, often referred to as the way of the intercepting fist, stands as a testament to Lee's revolutionary mindset. Unlike conventional martial arts systems, Jeet Kune Do isn't bound by rigid techniques. Instead, it embodies fluidity and adaptability, both in combat and in life. Central to Jeet Kune Do's ethos are principles of simplicity, directness, and freedom. At its core lies the concept of interception, an approach that involves preemptively countering the opponent's attacks or intentions before they manifest fully. Executing interception demands heightened awareness, impeccable timing, and a capacity to adjust swiftly to evolving circumstances, a hallmark of Lee's martial philosophy. In Jeet Kune Do training, practitioners learn to intercept using a variety of techniques, including punches, kicks, elbows, knees, traps, locks, and throws. But Jeet Kune Do is more than just a martial art. It's a philosophy for living. It promotes open-mindedness, flexibility, creativity, and a pursuit of self-awareness and personal growth. As Bruce Lee famously advised, practitioners should research your own experience, absorb what is useful, reject what is useless, add what is essentially your own.
Chuck Norris was deeply impressed by Lee's commitment and enthusiasm, which led to a strong bond between them. Then, seemingly out of nowhere, Lee reached out to Norris with an intriguing proposition. He had found success with two films in Hong Kong and was now eager to push cinematic boundaries with an unprecedented fight scene. Lee wanted Norris to join him as his opponent in this groundbreaking endeavor. Their friendship blossomed into a professional collaboration in 1972, when Bruce Lee extended an invitation to Chuck Norris to co-star in his third film, Way of the Dragon, a project that Lee both wrote and directed. Way of the Dragon is a 1972 Hong Kong martial arts action comedy film, marking Lee's sole complete directorial effort and the final film released during his lifetime. Alongside Lee, the film features Nora Miao, Robert Wall, Wei Ping Ao, and Chuck Norris in prominent roles. The storyline follows Tang Lung, a talented martial artist from Hong Kong who travels to Rome to assist his friends Chen Ching Hua and her uncle Wang. They are facing intimidation from a local crime boss who seeks control of their restaurant. Tang Lung uses his kung fu prowess to defend the establishment from the gangsters while also immersing himself in the sights and sounds of the vibrant city. The climax of the film sees Tang Lung facing off against Colt, the hired assassin of the crime boss, in an epic showdown set in the Colosseum. Way of the Dragon enjoyed immense success at the box office, raking in over $130 million worldwide despite its modest budget of $130,000. Achieving a thousand-fold return on investment, it emerged as the top-grossing film of 1972 in Hong Kong and held the title of the highest-grossing Hong Kong film of all time. At the point of its release, its impact extended to the United States, where it debuted as Return of the Dragon, in 1974, and became the first Hong Kong film to claim the number one spot at the U.S. box office. Critically acclaimed, the film is widely hailed as one of the greatest martial arts movies ever made, showcasing Bruce Lee's remarkable talent and magnetism both behind and in front of the camera. Its iconic sequences, including the nunchaku duel, the alley brawl, and the climactic confrontation with Chuck Norris, have left an indelible mark on cinematic history. Through its action-packed narrative, Way of the Dragon also serves as a testament to Lee's martial arts philosophy, which prioritizes adaptability, ingenuity, and self-expression. The climactic battle between Lee and Norris unfolds within the ancient confines of the Colosseum, earning widespread acclaim as one of cinema's finest fight sequences, each martial artist showcases their distinctive skills and techniques. Lee relies on his lightning-fast speed and agility, while Norris harnesses his formidable strength and endurance. Notably, the fight is lauded for its authenticity, as the combatants deliver blows with full force and for its mutual respect, evident in the respectful bows exchanged before and after the bout. Ultimately, Lee emerges victorious over Norris, concluding the duel with a poignant display of honor, draping his jacket over his defeated opponent as a gesture of respect. Chuck Norris has offered his own perspective on Bruce Lee's untimely demise, sharing his insights during a martial arts demonstration at a San Diego Comic-Con convention. Norris, being close to Lee, was well acquainted with his health issues and lifestyle habits. Lee faced a significant setback when he attempted to lift weights beyond his capacity, resulting in a ruptured disc in his back. This injury left him hospitalized for three weeks, with doctors unsure if he would regain his ability to walk. The incident occurred in 1968 during a weightlifting session, specifically while performing an exercise known as Good Mornings. The ruptured disc caused considerable pain and severely restricted his movement, necessitating surgery and medication for recovery. Despite medical advice to prioritize rest and recuperation, Lee's stubbornness and impatience led him to continue intense training and exertion. He persisted in pushing his body to its limits, disregarding warnings to allow proper healing. 
Additionally, Lee grappled with a rapid metabolism, perpetually striving to increase his weight and muscle mass. To fuel his rigorous regimen, he maintained a diet rich in protein and supplemented with substances like ginseng and royal jelly to enhance energy levels and performance. Lee also adopted the practice of consuming large quantities of water, sometimes reaching up to 10 liters daily, in an effort to detoxify his system. Norris mentioned that Lee had an intense pursuit of perfection and a desire to excel in all aspects of his life. During his time in Hong Kong, while preparing for his upcoming film, Lee collaborated with actress Betty Tingpei, who was set to be his co-star. Lee experienced a severe headache during this period, leading Betty to provide him with antibiotics to alleviate the discomfort. Unfortunately, the combination of the medication he was taking for his back issues and the antibiotics triggered an adverse reaction, causing his brain to swell and resulting in either an aneurysm or ruptured blood cells in his brain. As per Norris, on the night of Lee's passing, he was still in Hong Kong gearing up for his next project, Game of Death. While working with Betty Ting Pei, who was also his mistress, Lee encountered another severe headache. Seeking relief, he asked Betty for one of her prescription painkillers, unaware that it contained aspirin. Norris pointed out that Lee had an aspirin allergy, and the inadvertent ingestion of the pill, coupled with his existing medication, supplements, and high water intake, triggered a reaction in Lee's body, leading to cerebral edema or swelling of the brain. He explained that Lee laid down on Betty's bed and never regained consciousness. Cerebral edema is a severe condition characterized by the accumulation of fluid in the brain, leading to heightened pressure within the skull. This elevated pressure can harm brain cells and impede blood flow and oxygen supply to the brain, posing a grave risk to health. The causes of cerebral edema can vary widely, encompassing factors such as traumatic brain injury, stroke, infection, tumor, diabetes, high altitude, and drug overdose. Symptoms of cerebral edema can manifest differently depending on the underlying cause and the extent of swelling. Some common indicators include headaches, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, weakness, confusion, vision disturbances, seizures, and loss of consciousness. Cerebral edema can typically be identified through a physical examination and various diagnostic tests like CT scans, MRIs, and blood tests. The choice of treatment varies depending on the root cause of the condition and the extent of intracranial pressure. Common treatment approaches encompass the use of medications, surgical intervention, and oxygen therapy. The primary aim of treatment is to reinstate proper blood flow and oxygenation to the brain while mitigating the swelling. Complications stemming from cerebral edema can be severe, potentially resulting in permanent brain damage, coma, or even death. Regrettably, there have been instances of notable individuals succumbing to cerebral edema, such as Alan Ladd, a renowned Hollywood actor famed for his roles in movies like Shane and The Great Gatsby. Ladd passed away in 1964 at the age of 50 due to an overdose of alcohol and sedatives, precipitating cerebral edema and subsequent respiratory failure. Nicolette Larson, the singer-songwriter renowned for her hit song L of Love, passed away in 1997 at the age of 45 due to complications arising from cerebral edema, which was exacerbated by liver failure. Following Bruce Lee's untimely demise, Chuck Norris honored his memory through various interviews and publications. Norris fondly portrayed Lee as a remarkable figure, crediting him as a revolutionary force in both martial arts and cinema. He emphasized Lee's humble and generous nature, highlighting how Lee's teachings inspired him to strive for self-improvement. Expressing his heartfelt sentiments, Norris lamented Lee's absence and expressed regret at not witnessing his continued growth and accomplishments. Maintaining a steadfast bond with Lee's family, particularly his son Brandon Lee, Norris became a guiding figure in Brandon's life. 
Despite being just eight years old at the time of his father's passing, Brandon inherited his father's fervor for martial arts and acting. Following in his father's footsteps, Brandon embarked on an acting career, featuring in notable films like Showdown in Little Tokyo, Rapid Fire, and The Crow. Norris assumed the roles of both mentor and friend to Brandon, providing guidance and support in his training, career endeavors, and personal challenges, including navigating issues like racism, media scrutiny, and familial expectations. Norris affectionately regarded Brandon as akin to a son, expressing immense pride in his achievements and character. Tragically, Brandon Lee's life was cut short in 1993 at the age of 28 due to a horrific accident on set of The Crow. During a scene involving a prop gun, Brandon was accidentally shot with a live round instead of blanks, leading to fatal injuries. Despite being rushed to the hospital, he could not overcome the severity of his wounds. The news of Brandon's untimely demise shook his family, friends, and admirers, marking yet another sorrowful loss in the Lee lineage. Chuck Norris, deeply saddened by the tragedy, paid his respects at Brandon's funeral, expressing profound grief over the loss of such a remarkable individual. Norris remembered Brandon as a talented actor with a promising future, emphasizing the profound impact of his passing. He likened the loss of Brandon to losing two sons and found solace in the hope that they were reunited in the afterlife. Although Norris's account of Bruce Lee's passing has faced scrutiny, some elements align with the conclusions drawn by Lee's biographer, Matthew Polly. In his book, Bruce Lee, A Life, Polly presents a compelling argument proposing that Lee's demise resulted from heat stroke. Heat stroke occurs when the body fails to regulate its temperature, leading to organ failure, brain damage, and ultimately death. Polly's theory is supported by thorough research and analysis of various facts and clues surrounding Lee's life and tragic end. Polly highlights three significant factors contributing to Bruce Lee's susceptibility to heat stroke. Firstly, Lee underwent surgery to remove his armpit sweat glands to enhance his appearance on screen. However, this procedure compromised his body's ability to regulate temperature through sweating, particularly problematic in Hong Kong's hot and humid climate. Sweat glands play a crucial role in thermoregulation, and their removal heightens the risk of heat-related ailments. Secondly, Lee's medical history included a previous episode of heat stroke, occurring 10 weeks before his demise while recording dialogue for Enter the Dragon. During this incident, he collapsed and experienced convulsions in a poorly ventilated room, prompting hospitalization and a diagnosis of cerebral edema. Although doctors treated him with mannitol to alleviate brain swelling, Polly suggests that heat stroke was the underlying cause, overlooked by medical professionals. Dr. Lisa Leon supports this view, emphasizing the heightened risk of recurrent heat stroke and the potential for multi-organ dysfunction during recovery, which can lead to severe long-term consequences, including disability and death. Thirdly, adding to his analysis, Polly underscores the circumstances surrounding Bruce Lee's demise on July's sweltering day in 1973. As temperatures soared to 33.9 degrees Celsius or 93 degrees Fahrenheit, Lee found himself at his mistress, Betty Ting's apartment, where he complained of a headache and turned to Equagasic, a medication comprising aspirin and a tranquilizer. Seeking relief, he retired to her bed, ensconced beneath a heavy blanket. Polly suggests that the combination of the drug, blanket, and oppressive heat set the stage for Lee's fatal heat stroke. Furthermore, he posits that the medication might have obscured symptoms like thirst, fatigue, and confusion, hindering Lee from recognizing the onset of heat stroke and seeking assistance. Polly's hypothesis finds resonance in the autopsy findings, which revealed an absence of allergic reactions such as hives or breathing difficulties while Lee's blood tests indicated standard levels of aspirin and tranquilizer, discounting an overdose. 
Notably, his brain exhibited a 133% increase in swelling, indicative of cerebral edema. Additionally, Dr. Donald Langford's testimony, following his examination of Lee's remains, lends credence to the possibility of Hatstroke as a primary factor in his demise. One of the most intriguing theories surrounding Bruce Lee's death implicates the triads, a notorious Chinese organized crime syndicate operating in Hong Kong and beyond. According to this narrative, Lee incurred the wrath of the triads during his time in Hong Kong, leading them to orchestrate his demise for several reasons. Firstly, Lee's unorthodox portrayal of Chinese martial arts in his films was perceived as a direct challenge to the traditional norms upheld by the martial arts community, some of whom were purportedly aligned with the triads. By defying conventional standards and introducing innovative techniques, Lee threatened the triads' influence over martial arts and disrespected their cultural legacy. Furthermore, Lee's refusal to comply with the triad's demands for protection money posed a financial threat to their operations. As a highly successful and affluent actor and producer, Lee's resistance to extortion undermined the triad's control over the lucrative film industry in Hong Kong. Moreover, Lee's plans to expand his career globally, particularly in Hollywood, threatened to diminish the triad's hold on him prompting them to view him as a defiant adversary who needed to be dealt with. Lastly, personal vendettas or feuds may have fueled the triad's desire to target Lee. His outspoken nature and unwavering confidence may have led to clashes with triad members or associates, resulting in simmering animosities that culminated in a tragic end. It's plausible that Lee's interactions with certain leaders or members of the triads could have provoked feelings of resentment or a desire for vengeance. Additionally, Lee's romantic entanglements, including his relationship with actress Betty Ting Pei, who was present on the day of his death, might have sparked jealousy or animosity among some triad members, leading them to seek harm against Lee or tarnish his reputation. According to the triad theory, there were various methods the syndicate could have employed to eliminate Lee, including poisoning, shooting, stabbing, or strangulation. However, the most commonly speculated scenario involves the use of dim mac, also known as the death touch. This technique targets specific pressure points on the body, capable of causing internal damage or even death. It's conceivable that the triads enlisted the services of a skilled martial artist, possibly a rival or a former student of Lee, to administer the dim mac either directly or indirectly. The resulting effects, such as brain swelling or cardiac arrest, could have led to Lee's untimely demise. The triad theory gains some credibility from various circumstantial evidence and testimonies. Firstly, Lee had reportedly received multiple death threats and faced interference from the triads in his film projects. Additionally, just two months prior to his death, Lee experienced an episode of cerebral edema, which some speculate could have been an unsuccessful attempt on his life using Dimmac. On the day of his death, Lee had complained of headaches and dizziness, symptoms that align with the effects of Dimmac. Furthermore, Lee had visited a restaurant believed to be owned by the triads, raising suspicions of poisoning or an attack. Compounding the intrigue, Lee was found deceased in the apartment of Betty Ting Pei, rumored to have ties to the triads, suggesting potential involvement. The presence of bruising and needly marks on Lee's body further fuels speculation, hinting at possible full play or attempts by the triads to conceal their actions. In the aftermath of Lee's death, a series of tragic incidents followed, including the fatal shooting of his son Brandon Lee on a film set and the mysterious disappearances or deaths of associates linked to Lee, possibly as part of efforts to silence witnesses. Some speculate that Bruce Lee may have fallen victim to the purported Lee family cursor. According to this belief, the Lee family is under the influence of a malevolent spirit, targeting its male members and leading to their premature and often violent deaths.
This supposed curse has tragically affected numerous Lee relatives, extending beyond Bruce and his son Brandon, who met his demise in a tragic accident while working on The Crow. But what are the origins of this curse, and is there any substantial evidence supporting its existence? The notion of the Lee family curse is deeply rooted in Chinese folklore and superstition. Some narratives trace its beginnings to the lineage of a renowned general named Li Yuan, who lived during the Tang Dynasty. Li Yuan distinguished himself as a loyal and courageous warrior defending the emperor against rebels. However, his valor also earned him enemies, including a powerful sorcerer who purportedly laid a curse upon Li Yuan and his descendants. This curse is supposedly decreed that none of them would live beyond the age of 33. Alternatively, another version of the legend connects the curse to a different figure in Li's family history, General Li S. from the Song Dynasty. Li S. is depicted as a traitor who allied with the invading Mongols, betraying his emperor. As retribution, the emperor's court wizard is said to have cursed Li S. and his progeny foretelling their demise by fire or metal. Regardless of their veracity, these tales have exerted a profound influence on the Lee family's beliefs and actions over the centuries. Bruce Lee's parents, Lee Hoi Chuen and Grace Ho, were deeply spiritual and superstitious individuals, particularly following the passing of Bruce's elder brother before Bruce's birth. While the exact cause of his brother's demise remains uncertain, some speculate it may have been linked to the alleged curse. In a bid to safeguard Bruce from malevolent spirits, his parents took precautionary measures. They bestowed upon him the nickname Little Phoenix and clothed him in girl's attire, even piercing his ears, all in an attempt to deceive any evil entities into perceiving him as a girl. Moreover, they refrained from calling him by his given name, Junfen fearing it might inadvertently attract the attention of such spirits. Bruce Lee's parents were deeply entrenched in the belief of fate, or Ming, which posits that one's life path is predetermined by celestial forces. Seeking insight, they sought counsel from fortune tellers and astrologers, who revealed that Brucey possessed a robust and auspicious destiny, albeit one fraught with peril. They cautioned that he would encounter numerous trials and adversaries, advising utmost vigilance concerning his health and safety. Despite their efforts to shield Bruce from the influence of both fate and the alleged curse, they were unable to dissuade him from chasing his aspirations. From a young age, Bruce Lee displayed a rebellious and adventurous spirit, drawn to martial arts movies and the allure of challenge. At 18, he ventured to the United States, where he immersed himself in study, instruction, and the development of his revolutionary martial arts philosophy, Jeet Kune Do. Concurrently, he embarked on a Hollywood career where he encountered prejudice and discrimination, yet managed to shatter barriers and dispel stereotypes. Rising to stardom, he became not only a cinematic icon, but also a symbol of empowerment and inspiration. However, his success was not without its detractors, as he garnered enemies, rivals, and critics along the way. As we delve into the enigmatic circumstances surrounding Bruce Lee's untimely demise, the revelations offered by Chuck Norris provide compelling insights. From theories of cerebral edema to the speculation of triad involvement and the enduring myth of a Lee family curse, the truth remains elusive. What are your thoughts on these revelations? Do you believe Norris's account sheds light on the mystery, or do you find the truth still obscured? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more captivating content. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.